Today, I thought we would take a little look together at the camp of Jacob wrestling in the wilderness. And many of us have had a Jacob moment. I know that or a season actually in our lives. Um, or we've watched other people have seasons and that can be just as painful. So I've, of course, had my time to difficulty. And four years ago, I found myself in a deep struggle and one where I was basically flailing for solid ground. And so I asked a dear friend, Al, who's a vicar, if I would survive it. And his response was, yeah, you will survive the dark night of the soul, but you will be different. And his words sowed hope, actually, in the midst of realism, because the challenges were on several fronts and required more strength than I actually had. So his words steadied me through extreme pressure, which I'm just about coming out of. But in the middle of it all, I most definitely felt I was wrestling with God. How could you let this happen? How dare you abandon us? Call yourself God. I trusted you, dot, dot, dot. And I felt like it was God doing the wounding. And I tried in vain to bargain. And there were tears. And there even were times of me physically wailing in the woods or on the beach where literally physically wailing. And my faith has been stripped back to the bone. And I would say it stretched almost to the point of splitting. But I have somehow managed to cling on. But behind my own pain and your personal pain, there has always been and will continue to be the climate struggle bearing down. So Al was right that I did survive, but I have been changed. And I guess like Jacob, I do walk differently through life now. So I try to sit lighter on things. Not always successfully. <laughs> I'm better at rolling with painful stuff. It, maybe someone can mute. I think somebody's not on mute. They might not want to catch their own giggles on record. I've realized there are worse things than dying. And I don't say that lightly. And I can see with hindsight that God is to be trusted after all to be God and that God is not simply a bigger version of me, thankfully. But I do still have fear and situations do still threaten to brew a storm again. And I know that you can relate, but I do feel my heart is stronger and maybe my resolve is clearer, but not always. So I do have a special love for this passage, which is why I thought in Lent we could come to it for a bit of sustenance. So I hope it blesses you. But there is a warning. There's always a warning with me. This is merely my best effort, OK, to shed some light on this lovely passage. It's a short space of time. And if at a time it appears reductionist, I do apologise. But I hope there is something for everyone. I've drawn heavily on the writings of Joan Chittester, if you've heard of her, and it's a, a, I'm trying to get a pastoral space today. So hope often springs out of struggle like green shoots under dead leaves, and it grows within us despite our moments of darkness. There's no such thing as a life without struggle. Behind every face on the Zoom today, there are struggles or memories of them. Struggles stretch the mind, but threaten to kill the soul. And clinging on in struggle is a risk of mammoth proportions, but not carrying on is often not an option. And we will all be changed by things that we did not want changed. Our health, our status, death, loss of all kinds. How do we bear them, survive them, and what happens to us spiritually as a result? I think a spirituality of struggle is needed more now than ever, I think, for the following reasons. The entire universe seems so fragile. War, yet yeah, we are capable of the unthinkable. Social upheaval, deep uprootedness, division politics, rich and poor divide. With interestingly, I didn't realize this, the largest economies belong to corporations, not nations. Great, isn't it? COVID and then the earth under attack. But add to that tiring list, my friends, a major concern that much of the church isn't even awake to the deeper call to justice or the deep change that's needed. So we've got to shake her awake as well. And struggle, we'll look at this morning, is a process where we hold the tensions. God is good, yet. God is for me, but God lives in and through me. So how come dot, dot, dot. So it's Jacob to, to whom we try to turn and he wrestled with God and he emerged wounded, but very much alive. And I've asked Andy back if he can unmute himself. He's just going to read us the short 10, 10 verses. So just sit back and listen. Genesis 32, verse 22 following. You're right, Andy. Oh, you, Andy, you're muted. <laughs> I think you might have a problem, Rachie, because Andy's showing is unmuted on my list, but okay. Andy is showing is muted okay, on the Andy, as much as you, I love you to bit. Okay, don't worry. I'll, Andy, I love you. You're much better reader than me. I will now bash on in appalling style. <laughs> that night. Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, as, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over his possessions 
weapons. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Well, I mean, that is a weird and wonderful passage, right? It shows up in a wider story, 100% unannounced, unexpected, unexplained. It comes less field and makes no sense at all from a literary point of view, because it doesn't advance the storyline and it's never mentioned again. In the rest of scripture so what on earth is it doing there before this Jacob's life was really good and it was getting better if you rummage around the wider text you'll see Jacob had gone away from Laban his father-in-law and he was on the way to apologize to his brother Esau after years of being at odds with each other and things were only up he was free he was in his own land he was being out of service to Laban he had a big family wealth and everything else the past was finally put to bed and he was, had a future to step into then out of nowhere, he has this one night, a night like no others. And he's tired, he's alone in the dark, and he ends up in a struggle where he's wrestling with the unknown. And the figure, it says, is not of human origin. So I guess the same as us, when we wrestle with God or with demons within, you can take the passage on both levels, physical or metaphorical. Jacob shows us, though, it's not the issue of finding something difficult, but rather feeling faced with the impossible that is so hard, which is climate and us. OK, the otherworldly being was too big, too strong, yet Jacob clung on. And just when we're feeling very vulnerable and we want to let go and give up, that's when we find ourselves in a position of having to survive in the struggle, to go on, to live, because going on is the only thing that we can do. Take Ukraine at the moment, cling on, because that's all they can do. So let's take a closer look at Jacob and enter in and see what we can find there for ourselves. The first thing the struggle brings, Jacob, is this, isolation. Struggle, struggle always happens in the deepest part of our lives, which often leads to isolation, that the hidden places where no one can see. And it says Jacob was left alone, indeed. Alone at night. When will this pain end? What is happening? Can I name it and tame it? I need some control. And he even begs to know what it is called, what this struggle is called. But he doesn't get an answer. We find ourselves in the climate struggle. OK, it must be born together. It is too large. It is too frightening. It is too strong. We must unite and pull close to stop the struggle being made even harder by bleak isolation. And as activists trying to follow Jesus in justice, churches are often the most isolating places. So cling into your sustaining places, CCA being one of them. Spot isolation and work very hard to keep in genuine, authentic community. Secondly, he faced darkness, spiritual, mental and emotional darkness. Now, have you ever woken up? Up in a pitch black room, I when you literally have no idea where you are, that hideous heart bumping moment. I had it once in a tent in Romania and I couldn't remember whether I was in a tent. I couldn't find the zip. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I panicked and I was like flailing in this tent. That is what this spiritual um, and physical darkness does. That utter suffocation. We have no map. We have no path. We have total disorientation. When things we love and hold on to that anchor us or our purpose goes, then we're plunged off into darkness, which is what happened to him. And then we are faced with a God of absence. Anyone felt abandoned by God? I certainly have. Dark nights the soul is the process where we shed everything but God. But often it feels like we're also shedding our faith. But dark nights the soul, as with Jacob, are vital, actually, in our spiritual development. Horrible, horribly um, vital because darkness can become the incubator of light. It's much like winter or the night before the dawn. So let that be an encouragement to us. We are before the dawn of whatever's going to come. It's not all darkness. Darkness can also lead to the development of faith. And this Joan Chichester says this. She says, we must believe like Jacob that the dawn will come all in good time. She says this. We are called to believe that God is with us, the energetic and loving God who made for us a good world, who walks with us, who holds us up as we go. The most faithful act that maybe we can do in these days is to keep on living and living with love and laughter to banish the darkness for others. 
As we enter the rebellion, let's live with love and laughter to banish the darkness for others. Thirdly, Jacob's struggle released so much adrenaline and fear, alone, wrestling, struggling for his very life. Would he survive? No idea. He had no idea if he would survive. But what choices does he actually have? He can surrender, but at what cost to his future? This is his land, his home, his way of life, his area of responsibility. He cares. Or he could turn and run away. But again, to where? Because everything he cares about is there. His family, his livestock, his history, his sense of belonging, it's all there. That would mean abandoning everything. So the only real option he had was to remain in the struggle and hope for the best. And he was forced to see it through. There may be no life left for him there, but there certainly wasn't life anywhere else. I know we can relate to that with climate. We try to see things through. We try to hang on. We try to remain, however big the challenges we face are. But where else but planet Earth can we go? Okay. We try to remain pain, faithful in the painful hold we find ourselves in. We are in a painful hold and we have to remember that to fa remain faithful in that painful hold. Fear paralyzes us. We know that it can be overwhelming and grappling with the issue isn't what wears us down actually it's the unknown answers to the hidden questions that beat us back i'll say that again it's the unknown answers to the hidden questions that beat us back and create the fear would jacob succeed will we succeed what's coming what's the future look like if we fail what's the future look like if we succeed who will join me will god come through how bad does it have to get fear is more crippling than any disease when we're faced with the hidden questions now, Howard Thurman, if you know him, says this. It's beautiful. He says, fear is one of the persistent hounds of hell that dogs the footsteps of the poor and dispossessed. Our struggle in the climate crisis, guys, links us to the world's poorest. And Thurman goes on to say that for the poor, fear is nowhere in particular, yet everywhere is a moose that carry, is carried around. It has its roots deep in the heart of relations between the weak and the strong, between controllers of the environment and those who are controlled by it. We in CCA, this, this bit made me cry actually when I read this bit. We join the poor and the marginalized in entering a struggle that at times is deeply frightening. Just to enter it for them, because that's what they experience most of the time in life, gives me courage to carry on and hold on. The poor know they have no weapons to fight back and no power. So I will play my part along with you. That is a big motivator. And for Jacob, I'm sure he found the strength because he knew his family and livestock were over the other side of the river. OK, that was a definite motivation to hang on. So we must harness the same for our, for our brothers and sisters. If we can hold on in fear, it can give us the gift of courage. And we collect courage like treasures from the deep. All right. We're buoyed up, aren't we? We seek out stories of courage. I look at CCA and all the courage going on and go, wow, I need that. Look at Zelensky, the courage of nurses in the pandemic, etc. Earth protectors. We feed off courage. All right. Because courage is a capacity to stand our ground or, as Jonathan said last week, sit on the ground, actually. To speak the truth, even in the face of overwhelming odds. And Jacob is the, is the absolute epitome of this. He's like a tick that's burrowed into fur. He's determined to cling on. But courage is actually an attitude. It's not an action. It's an attitude. Um, courage is a part of ourselves that's often hidden away and is only set alight by fear. We're going to look at that in the breakout room. When fear can set alight courage. If we don't have the fear, we might not develop the courage. Fourthly, Jacob felt powerless. Now, powerless is, powerlessness is when we're powerless to help ourselves. And this is the climate and war conundrum. What difference can I actually make to my own future in all of this? This feeling of powerless need, needs us to know um, either often we exit the situation because we can't actually cope with it. And maybe that's got brutal consequences. Or maybe we think we can't make a difference to switch off. Or the powerlessness is crushing. And I just want to acknowledge here we do sit with deep sorrow um, when for some life and the powerlessness is too much and we sit with sorrow and remember those of our friends who've taken their own lives powerlessness is real powerlessness is the way we come face to face with our own mortality and vulnerability and we, if we can make it through this challenge then we can get the gift of surrender that's what Jacob had surrendering is accepting that we are all we have it's not what we would choose but it's all we have it applies to your own personal lives and to climate. Not a single one of us on this call wants the weight of the climate crisis. Not a single one of us wants to see the animals and ecosystem suffering. But all loss means we have to surrender to new meanings and new circumstances, the ones we never wanted to hear.
And in accepting that, we can find the strength often to hold on. And Jacob, by surrendering to the hold, it shows that he came to the point of understanding that persisting was enough. The goal of persisting, not necessarily overcoming, persisting in the climate crisis. The fifth thing the struggle brings is vulnerability. OK, anyone here dislocated their hip? Raise your hand if you have. No, my grandfather dislocated his hip and I remember he fell off a bank and he dislocated. It took one month for the bruising to come out fully. One month because the, the, the dislocation was so deep. The pain was so deep. We must be honest about pain that we carry. OK, and I think we need to be very clear on our regen, which we are. If you didn't listen in last week, listen in to the one from last week about regen, because we need to be accountable to protect each other when we are going through pain in this in this climate crisis. Because if I acknowledge my limit and I pull back, that gives someone else the opportunity to step up. So there's there's no it's, it's a, our vulnerability is a strength to this group. But let's not underestimate how painful it can be. Sixthly, exhaustion. Exhaustion is interesting in the Jacob story. They don't, they don't go on about the wound. What's gone on about is this word. It goes on and on and on. His struggle went on and on and on. It went on and on and on. We know this in life. It's the unending grind. It's carrying the weight for on and on and on. Climate crisis goes on and on. The text underscores this again and again. Jacob was exhausted because he'd run out of human energy. The invisible energy in struggle is exhaustion, hence this need for regen, content to prayer, daily prayer, etc. Feeling we have lost in the fight for climate is exhausting. OK, but again, it's not about losing or winning, as Ruth mentioned years ago at the beginning of CCA. It's about obedience and relationship with our companion God. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow, because he is there. If we survive the exhaustion, guys, we get to endurance, which is what he got. No one wants to hear that in the middle of being knackered, right? Say, hang on, you're going to get endurance. Oh, shut up. I'm too tired. But endurance is about having the heart to keep trying to do the possible, even if it's unattainable. OK, and it's being willing to cope with what is until something better comes along, until something else begins. So it's about bearing what we can, bearing what we can. All right. Endurance is the willingness to keep on doing what must be done because it's meaningful in itself. OK, that's the endurance. Keep on going. But let's not diminish now the, the, the seventh thing it brings him, which is the last thing it brings him, which is this wound, this scar. Um, real struggle hurts and we are never the same. But we now know things we didn't know before the struggle began. So we are bigger if we've been allowed to be stretched through this. It says Jacob limped. And as I said earlier, dislocation is mighty painful. Jacob couldn't walk straight ever again. He had a permanent reminder of that night. Scarring can give us the gift of transformation because it makes us a transforming people. CCA is a transforming space. It absolutely is. We are able to reach out. We're able to connect and we're able to deeply listen because we've been transformed. Strong Struggle is the reason actually the maturity has got nothing to do with chronological age. I've met the most wonderful, wise people who are 20, 14, 6 who've struggled. You will have done the same. So struggle allows us to be transformed because we go beyond ourselves. CCA, the climate crisis, calls us beyond ourselves constantly. We all come out different to how we went in, of course, and sometimes struggle turns to sour. We've met people like that, but not always. And often we come out deeper, richer and stronger. But it's not possible to say the same. And it shows us actually who we were if we look back with courage at where we've come from. And I know that with the last four years, I look back and think I'm unrecognisable from what I was. Um, so we've got to have the courage to look from our journey as well. And it also shows us how little we actually need in life to be happy. And this is where we speak into joy in enough, loosening our grip on capitalist orgies, because that is what they are. So to conclude, before we go into breakouts, Jacob wounded, exhausted, confused, struck down in the, in the dark, emotionally experienced a stronger person. He didn't give in or give up. He struggled against forces far superior and he struggled till light appeared on the horizon. But Jacob shows spiritual life isn't about doing good or being socially virtuous, etc. It's about a life 
reconciled with the world around us. And this is, let me explain what I mean. Jacob had stolen from his brother, lied to his father, run away to avoid being punished. Then he was tricked by his father-in-law, but he survived all that. He is then faced is himself in this dark night and all his weaknesses so there's a sense of him coming home to himself and I think that's what the night of struggle did for him he begged God for blessing and then he trusts that it will come he walks on with a limp trusting it will come it hasn't come he trusts it will come despite or maybe because of the limp actually he admits his limits he hangs on he survives and then he rejoins the world and goes on not easy i'm sure and in the west we shun pain don't we happiness in our culture is the goal for everything dumb the pain everybody but actually pain is part of the process of being fully alive in our lives and wrestling with god i think is built into our lives if we learn uh, about god and ourselves through it it proves god is no puppeteer actually or magician because difficulties come um but he can companions with us in the darkness. So struggle is not simply an event. This is a re really strong quote. It's again by Joan Chister. Struggle is not simply an event. It is an internal process that accompanies a blow to the psyche so momentous, so sudden, so unexpected and so unwanted that there is no way whatsoever to prepare for it before it's coming. But struggle forces us to confront our illusions of the world and ourselves and requires us to become the hope for others, to embody the hope, not to seek hope, but to embody it. So struggle is a hard gift, but a strong one. And the beauty and darkness in the valleys of struggle is this thing called hope. So what I want us to do now, I'll put you in breakout rooms. I've got three questions which I would like you to think, you don't have to think about all of them or any of them, but I'd like you to think about these if you could. When did you feel fear give you the spark and fuel to set your courage alight? I share that. It's different. It might be personal, it doesn't have to be about climate, but when did you feel fear give you that spark to light the courage? That's the first thing. Secondly, what has touched you about the Jacob narrative today and what will you take home to sustain you and what are you going to revisit? Because we have to embed these things in our lives. We don't just touch on something once, like a standing stone. And third thing, how does the knowledge that God is this constant companion in the climate crisis actually help you? Actually help you, okay? So I want to end by quoting the author and professor, Julia Gatter, who's describing the heart of the Apostle Paul's ministry as holding the paradox of struggle and suffering and new life, because that's where we're at, always, actually. So you've got Christ's resurrection and crucifixion are always held together. And I think that's really helpful for us. So suffering and death, we know, she says, are everywhere, from roadkill to mass shootings in America to tsunamis to, to war. So we know that the whole creation, it says in Romans 8, has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves. Paul's metaphor of labor pains implies suffering is woven, as we know, into the whole process of creation from the very beginning. But it also continues through birth to new creation. This, this gave me real hope, actually, that the pain and the loss and the tragedy and the struggle we're in is part of the labor pains of a new birth. I'm not responsible for that, God is, but it's not just labor, but death cries. It's labor pains to a new birth. That was, to me, was quite encouraging. But then she says this, we experience resurrection as St. Paul did. Without the resurrection to enliven his own experience of struggle, Paul would have been both afflicted and crushed, perplexed and driven to despair, struck down and destroyed, but he is not because the risen Christ illuminates everything. According to the gospel accounts, the risen Jesus repeatedly displays his wounds. They are not left behind. Christ is both crucified and risen. The baptism is immersion into both sides of this paschal mystery. The resurrection's presence brings hope streaming to us from the glory yet to be revealed. So Jesus' resurrection brings us hope streaming from the glory yet to be revealed. So I wanted to end with that. We have a God who is with us, companions with us, but speaks to us from the hope 
that is not yet happened 